Welcome to my talk. My name is Jan Wieck. I work for OpenSCG. For those who are a little newer to the Postgres community, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. I am a Postgres user since version 4.2, that is 94 that we're talking about. I did join the Postgres community around 95. I am mostly responsible for all of those headaches, including, but not limited to Sloney. And I used to be a core team member between 2000 and 2010. When we're talking about benchmarking, we first need to know why we are benchmarking. Now, I have an idea why dogs mark benches, but with people, it's a little different. So there is the typical sales guy question, mirror, mirror on the wall, which is the fastest database? And I say, no, you don't get that answer from me because I can't tell them. There are license restrictions, but there are enough good questions to ask where we might need database benchmarking. Uh, one of them is, of course, is the next version of Postgres faster? We hear here on the uh, show all the time, yes, 9.6 is so much faster, and we improved speed here and performance there, and wonderful, but is it faster for me? Is my application going to run faster? Because going through the upgrade just because the version number changed, that's not good enough of a reason, right? Especially if there's eventually, with the upgrade, more involved because of incompatibilities and porting effort and so on. Um, another good question is how far does my hardware scale? Um, right sizing, you know, um, Grant will hate me for this, but people, go now and since it's only a mouse click away, they get the next bigger uh, instance of the virtual machine. Yes, you love that. But at the end of the day, that costs money and nobody needs to waste money. So they uh, say, but wait a second, now this thing has so many idle cycles. Can we actually downscale the server a little bit? Yeah, because we are now over provisioned. And of course, tuning. Uh, you're not tuning in your production environment, I hope. So, so when you really want to do tuning, you need to apply a similar workload to a test server and tune there and see what uh, can be done. How can I squeeze out the maximum of my existing hardware? Now, to be absolutely clear, the best thing you can test is your application. There is absolutely no benchmark in the world that does exactly what your application does. Um, that, of course, requires that you have a proper performance test harness. And oftentimes, I see that people say, oh, yeah, we have a test harness. And it's a functional regression test where they run, basically, or try to run through all, all their code paths, uh, or most of them. That is not a performance test harness. And even if you run that 20, 40, 100, 2,000 times and try to run it in parallel, it's still not a performance test. Yeah, so um, if we don't have a uh, performance test harness for the application, then the next best thing is, of course, a benchmark that is close enough. Um, in my talk, I will be comparing benchmarks against each other. I don't want this to be understood as telling you which is the better benchmark, because the better benchmark is always the one that behaves more like your application. It is completely irrelevant for you whether that thing is compliant to the standard that it follows or not, uh, that's not the question for you. That's completely academic. What you care for is that it represents your application as close as possible. <clears throat> Other criteria when we are looking to use a benchmark uh, is that we scale it 
to what you expect your application to use in database sizes, table sizes. Um, the, a similar size to TPS ratio. Yeah, if your application has a 500 gigabyte database and it runs at something like approximately 6,000 transactions per second, then you want to recreate that and then scale from there. But you first want to create, recreate that so that you can verify with um, monitoring that it actually does what your application does, that it does create a similar disk I.O. pattern, network I.O. pattern, CPU usage, memory usage. Because that is the confirmation, yes, I got close enough. That also includes complexity of transactions. There is a difference between running a single insert 20,000 times or running a transaction that has insert, update, delete, and, and uh, selects in it, while parallel some other transaction is running uh, many thousand uh, row selects. Yeah? So the transaction mix and the transaction complexity is important. Okay, at this point, let's assume you don't have a test harness, you want to pick a standard benchmark and get an approximation of your uh, application. So really get into the mindset. Um, I will be using the still popular, for whatever reason, um, TPCC. And you decided that TPCC is a good enough approximation of your application. All right? That is the decision made. And now we are looking for an implementation of the TPC standard. Now, all the benchmarks that I can find, basically, are approximations of the TPCC standard. They are not exactly that. They all claim something like um, um, closely uh, TPCC. Well, closely is a pretty loose term. There is no exact definition of that. So now to understand, is this now closer or further away from my application, we need to know what are the differences between the standard and that benchmark implementation. Because the TPCC standard um, does not tell you how you have to implement the uh, benchmark. It just says what it does from a user perspective. Yeah, and just for the record, I choose the TPCC here as an example. There are dozens of other benchmarks out there, benchmarks that do uh, um, data warehousing, analytics, benchmarks that say we emulate something like Wiki or Facebook, yeah? So you need to pick the one that is closest to you. Um, <coughs> I looked at three of the implementations um, just because I only have 45 minutes today and I did not want to turn this into a two-week seminar. Um, number one is the DBT2, um, which, as far as I can tell, is a proper implementation of the TPCC. Um, but unfortunately, its model comes from a different time, and modern database server sizes uh, just break it. Um, the next one is HammerDB 2.16. Um, there is a new version out, actually several new versions. I looked at 2.19 and was surprised that all of a sudden the database size, the initial load of the database had doubled. Uh, so the obvious candidate was looking at uh, something like fill factor and I saw the first thing on a table that has only ever insert and delete operations going on, a fill factor of 50. Who here in the room would uh, do a fill factor of 50 on a table that has that pattern? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nobody. 
Yeah, so instead of trying to fix that in the benchmark and, and go all the way through it, I said, no, I, I don't deal with that. I go back to the version that I know works. Yep. And the last one is, oh, important piece about uh, HammerDB. HammerDB does not implement the exact application model that the TPCC describes. And therefore, it can't do the proper uh, response time measurement. I'll get to that in detail later. Uh, Benchmark SQL is the last one. Um, there is currently a release candidate 2 out for the version 5.0. I use 5.0 because that has a major code overhaul in it that actually allowed to implement foreign keys on the tables and so on. All right. Um, that one too has no chance of uh, measuring the proper user response times that are required uh, because it follows a single similar uh, uh, application um, model as HammerDB. <coughs> to understand what we are doing here, what these uh, things uh, do, I want to quickly go over the model of the TPCC. What we have here is an application that sits at the center that talks to the database. And uh, this application has multiple worker threats, processes, whatever technology you want to do. Uh, you would be allowed to put this onto multiple servers all the way, sharing that uh, or load sharing. That's not dis uh, defined by the TPCC, just that this is the model that there is an application. That application including the database, is called the system under test. And that is what we're measuring. How much throughput can that produce? The driver for this application is a simulated terminal that produces input and consumes the result output. The response time measurement has to happen at the um, input port basically of the application. So when you think about a web implementation where the application is the web server, then this would be port 80 on the web server. When the last byte of the HTTP request has come into the network interface, that's when the response time measurement starts. And when the last byte of the HTTP port 80 response has left the network interface, that's when the clock stops. <coughs> um, so the dbt2 implements that properly. If you look at this uh, uh, graph, I said up there, there needs to be 10 terminals per warehouse. This is one of those things that the TPCC describes about the sizing and the scaling. Now the dbt2 uh, um, emulates these terminals as P threads. And with a modern database server, uh, if you wanted to create, for example, a 500 gigabyte database, we are talking about a scaling factor of about 5,000 warehouses. So we would need 50,000 P threads, each of them using 10 megabytes of stack space and completely trashing the job scheduler. Those context switches are not handled by a machine. Sorry. Yeah, you, you would need a machine with a terabyte of RAM and uh, out the bazoo job scheduling. Ain't going to happen. Um, so unfortunately, uh, while the DBT2 is the only one who can do the, the timing measuring, uh, measurement properly, it ruled itself out that way. HammerDB. HammerDB is an interesting animal. Um, in that it is a Tickle TK GUI application. Who here loves Tickle TK? Hey, I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, it does uh, basically implement uh, in threads, it's multi threaded Tickle TK 8.6 if you need it to need, uh, have that detail. Um, it implements basically the application threads and then takes a random one of these terminals and plugs it right on top into the same thread. 
Um, okay. Um, it, therefore, since not all the terminals will be active, I mean, we're talking 50,000 terminals, uh, you don't want to have 50,000 max connections. That's not reasonable either. So you've got to have fewer uh, 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 application threads, each of them with one database connection. So we're talking something in the vicinity of dozens to hundreds, right? Um, and because of that, it can't do the proper response time measurement. Um, last thing is HammerDB does not have any options to regulate the rate of transaction. So it does, whenever one is done and the database has responded, it starts the next transaction and pushes in the next uh, requests. <coughs> Benchmark SQL is a fork of JTPCC that was done by uh, Dennis Lussier a while ago. It, as said, got a major uh, overhaul. It has a command line interface. It also does currently that agglutination of the application thread and the terminal. Um, however, it does have uh, uh, options to regulate the transaction mix as well as the transaction rate. And full disclosure, I am a maintainer and committer of that. Um, therefore, I can tell you that I do have plans to build a proper application model for that but it's not out there yet. <coughs> so, yeah, go in there. Um, so the model that we are seeing now is more looking like that there, where basically the terminal, one of all those terminals, has been picked and uh, plugged on top of the application uh, thread. And now, the only thing that we can measure is the response time of the database. But, as said, think of a web server. The user experienced response time is not when the request hits the database. Yeah? Or how long it's spent there. When you send a web request, that's when you start waiting and uh, that thing can sit for seconds in the operating system uh, pipeline or in, in the uh, web server's queue before the PHP script magically does something. Yeah? <clears throat> so we can't measure this. But we can do a lot of other things. So first of all, we need to scale this test. I did this uh, because we're not trying to show how great Postgres is. I want to show you what you need to do to run your own benchmarks. Yeah? So uh, this is not relevant, really, how big this thing is, uh, just for the sizing. So my uh, database server is a dedicated machine, uh, bare metal, so no virtualization going on here. Uh, it has 32 gigs of RAM, eight cores, fairly old. Um, it does have a very decent disk configuration. PG Data sits on a RAID 0 with four SSDs, and PGX Log sits on a RAID 10 made of six disks spinning Rust 15K RPM. That can take all the I.O. that I need. Yep, there is no I.O. bottleneck here. We're basically more memory bandwidth and CPU uh, bottlenecked. <clears throat> now, when we scale this, a uh, one day a warehouse of the TPCC is approximately 100 to 110 megabytes. And in the standard uh, 10 terminals per warehouse, the way they do this, the rate limiting, is by introducing keying and thinking times. So the simulated user types in and then sends in the request, and when the response comes back, he thinks about it, looks at the screen, then types in the next request. And in the standard, it says clearly that the maximum throughput that thing can achieve is 12.86 new orders per minute. Um, that is very outdated, yeah? 
This whole model is based on uh, 80s, 90s block terminal mainframe architecture. Um, it has very heavy weight uh, OLTP transactions. Uh, you don't do this today anymore. By the time you actually click send, uh, your uh, UI has done a, a bunch of little lookups in the database. Whenever you hover with the mouse over something, that goes something back and forth. This is no longer applicable. So I doubt that the TPCC is close enough to your application to be relevant. But it's a very nice example. Um, so I scaled this to a size of 400 warehouses, where the database is approximately 40 something gigabytes in size. Why this works is because several of the key tables are not completely uniformly accessed. The TPCC uses a non-uniform random number generator in several places, so each table has some really hot data and then gets cooler and cooler and cooler, and most of the rows are seldom to never accessed. And that allows me to stress basically all the pieces of my system. The really hot data should live in my shared buffers, the warm data should live in my OS buffers, and the cold data, yeah, I fetch it from disk. That's why I have SSDs, right? That's exactly why I bought them. And so this looks like a good scaling factor to me. Anyone, any questions or concerns? Then jump right in, please. <clears throat> Transaction late remitting and, and database scaling, um, OLTP is different from batch processing. It's, it may happen brief periods that your database server gets saturated from the load, but usually it's not the way that one database connection becomes idle and the next request is there. That's not how OLTP works. So therefore, we have this keying and thinking time model. Now at 400 warehouses, um, I calculate 190 maximum TPS. We gotta modify that a little bit because that's no longer uh, accurate for modern applications. 40 gigabyte database with 190 transactions per second. I'm willing to uh, uh, bump that up by a couple notches. But we need to keep in mind in this case that just racking up the TPS does more than just create better throughput. There is a table in uh, the system, or basically the whole order system is designed that an order gets created. It's an, it's an online uh, ordering system, right? So an order gets created, then time delayed after normally about uh, 11 hours, that order is delivered, which means that some row is inserted into a table 11 hours later, it gets deleted. During that time frame, uh, enough uh, new rows have been inserted into that table so that it's basically a uh, ring or a, uh, operated queue. Yeah? What the? Um, the same happens on several other tables, or similar happens. They get an insert, and 11 hours later, one update to the row, and that's it. If we now rack up the transactions per second simply, we shorten that time that the data sits in the queue. And in extreme cases, that can get down to very few minutes. And there is a difference between inserting a row and then updating it 11 hours later when it's no longer found in the OS buffer cache, for sure or inserting it and updating it two minutes later. That's quite a difference in, in buffer cache hit rate. Yeah, so we need to be careful not to overscale this now. Okay, I uh, promised graphs. Let's see the throughput. Now, since HammerDB 
does not allow any kind of throughput throttling. It is a batch, not an OLTP. Um, I configured benchmark SQL identical that it also does this full bore maximum throughput test. A maximum throughput test is not a bad thing, and it tells you something, but it's no longer OLTP. Uh, but it is a good way to find out where approximately is the maximum of my server. And that's a, a good way to start your sizing and, and configuring. So uh, without any rate limit, we, I scaled everything from TPS to new order per minute because that's this uh, uh, measurement unit that the TPCC uses. And it basically means um, in the... In the transaction mix, the new order transaction makes up approximately 45% of all transactions executed. 